Did you know that ParCast has a newsletter? Well, we do, and it'll keep you up to date on all things ParCast. Just go to ParCast.com and put in your email address. Then you'll be the first to know when we announce a live show, like the upcoming Serial Killers live tour Finesse and I are doing. Or be the first to know when we announce a new show, like my new podcast with Molly Brandenburg, Great Women of Business. Don't miss any news. Sign up for our newsletter now at ParCast.com. Due to the graphic nature of this cult's crimes, listener discretion is advised. This episode includes discussions of graphic material that some people may find offensive. We advise extreme caution for listeners under 13. John Humphrey Noyes' Oneida community was revolutionary in many ways. Long before the formation of the free love movement in the 1960s, or modern ideas about polyamory, the 19th century Oneida community abolished monogamy and practiced what they called complex marriage. This meant that every man and woman in the community was married to each other. The group practiced novel forms of birth control and child rearing, freeing women to live fuller lives and contribute in more ways to the community. But this seemingly pioneering community had a darker side. Noyes exploited his position as the Oneida community's leader and created a system that forced girls as young as 11 to have sex with him. But this just scratched the surface of Noyes' troubling desires. He was a vocal proponent of both eugenics and incest. And he combined these two ideas together in the worst possible way. He believed he could produce a superior child by having a baby with his own niece. Hi, I'm Greg Polson. And I'm Vanessa Richardson. And this is Cults. Today, we're going to continue our deep dive into the Oneida community. You may recognize the name because the community eventually transformed itself into one of the world's most successful silverware corporations. If you want to listen to any previous episodes of Cults, you can find them on your favorite podcast directory or on our website, parcast.com. And don't forget to subscribe while you're there, because a new episode comes out every Tuesday. You can also find us on Facebook and Instagram, at Parcast, and on Twitter, at Parcast Network. If you like what you hear, please leave a five-star review wherever you're listening. In the 1830s, John Humphrey Noyes gathered a group of followers in Putney, Vermont, before eventually founding the Oneida community in New York in 1848. The community lasted until 1881 and had 300 members at its 1866 peak. Oneida community members were Christian perfectionists. They believed that the second coming of Jesus had already taken place in 70 AD. This meant it was already possible to set up a kingdom of heaven on earth and live as saints. They thought their community's rules could enable them to lead sinless lives, where they were incapable of making mistakes. But Noyes took advantage of the idea that he was infallible to promote his controversial policies and satisfy his own sexual appetite. In part one of our investigation into the Oneida community, we explored the early life of John Humphrey Noyes, the development of his theology, and the conversion of his early followers. In part two, we'll dive into the rise and fall of the Oneida community. We'll uncover how Noyes convinced his hundreds of followers to support his ever-evolving religious doctrine. Oneida's belief system included a range of innovative ideas, such as birth control and greater freedom for female members. But it also included an assortment of disturbing policies designed to serve the twisted sexual needs of Noyes and the community leaders, including a sexual initiation policy for young children, a eugenics program, and incest. In the late 1830s, John Humphrey Noyes was busy gathering followers in Putney, Vermont. He convinced his siblings to join his fledgling group and married two of his sisters off to two of his new male converts. But Noyes quickly looked to expand their ranks. Enter George and Mary Cragen, two early and important converts. Mary discovered Noyes' writings in the summer of 1835, while the pair was ministering to the poor in New York. 
Mary was entranced by Noyes' ideas about finding a way to live a mortal life without sin. And by October of 1839, the Cragans were ready to fully embrace Noyes' teachings. But Noyes was infamous in New York, and when George's work colleagues found out that the couple supported Noyes, George was promptly fired. With George's job no longer tying them to New York City, the couple and their baby moved in with a family more sympathetic to their religious beliefs. Abram C. Smith, his wife, and four children happily made room for the Cragans at their farmhouse near Rondon on the Hudson River. The Smiths and the Cragans cohabitated well for a while, but Mary started getting spiritually restless at night. She told her husband she needed to speak with Smith about her religious troubles. The two had a number of long, private, nocturnal discussions in his study. George trusted Mary and shrugged off their meetings at first, but eventually he got suspicious. It wasn't long before George learned that Mary and Smith's late-night Bible study didn't involve a book. Smith had recognized Mary's religious gullibility. He utilized Noyes' writings about spiritual wives who could coexist alongside one's actual spouse to manipulate the married woman into sleeping with him. However, George's discovery of Mary's affair threatened to destroy their marriage. Noyes found out about the tense situation and realized he needed to keep a closer watch on his followers if he was going to keep them in the fold. He invited George and Mary to live with him in Putney. The Cragans were eager to save their marriage and quickly agreed to join Noyes in Vermont. In February of 1841, Noyes and the small group in Putney, consisting of his siblings and a handful of early followers, declared themselves the Society of Inquiry. They made it their task to, quote, make an open and united confession of this our belief and more effectually assist each other in searching the scriptures and in overcoming sin, end quote. They were Christian perfectionists, so ridding themselves of sin and living a perfect, godly life on earth was their number one goal. Noyes began to believe that they could only lead sinless lives by pooling their resources and living communally. In 1841, the Society of Inquiry began to communize their wealth. Noyes and his eight siblings contributed their father's estate of almost $20,000. Noyce's wife, Harriet, contributed $16,000. John Miller gave $2,000, and John Skinner and the Cragans each gave $200. The cumulative worth would total over $1 million in today's market. Noyce was easily able to convince his followers to contribute their wealth, but not everything was going smoothly for him. Noyes and his wife, Harriet, were struggling to have children, and Harriet endured a painful succession of stillbirths. This inspired Noyes to come up with a concept he would later introduce to the community as a whole, male continence, or coitus reservatus. Male continence is similar to the rhythm method, in which a man pulls out before ejaculating. The difference is that male continence prescribes that the man should pull out early but not ejaculate at all. Noyes hoped to spare his wife Harriet the pain of losing more children. He recognized that by removing the fear of pregnancy and its potential complications, his wife could enjoy sex. But Harriet still wanted to try for children. And on July 26, 1841, Harriet finally gave birth to their son, Theodore. With his finances and personal life in place, Noyes was finally in a position to focus on recruiting new members to his community. By March of 1843, group membership had risen to 35. That year, Noyes' younger sister, Charlotte, gave birth to his niece, Tirza C. Miller, who we'll hear more about later. In 1845, 34-year-old Noyes decided to formalize his policy of communal living. Noyes and his followers all signed an agreement, quote, for the purpose of sustaining the gospel of salvation from sin and gaining the advantages of union and combined capital." End quote. The contract delineated two categories of members, investors of property and time, and investors of time only. The document created a scale to measure member contributions. This way, if the community ever dissolved, they would have a plan for splitting up the communal property. But Noyes didn't just want the community to share property. He wanted them to share spouses. He just needed to come up with a religious doctrine to condone it. 
Noyes soon figured out a religious justification. He insisted that sex was not a sin, but rather a way to become more connected to God, and he codified this concept by inventing complex marriage. In complex marriage, every man was married to every woman, and every woman to every man. In later years, Noyes articulated the need for complex marriage as, quote, the only hopeful scheme of moral reform is one which will bring the sexes together, according to the demands of nature. The desire of the sexes is a stream ever running. If dammed up, it will break out, irregularly and destructively. And the refining effects of sexual love, which are recognized more or less in the world, will be increased a thousandfold when sexual intercourse becomes a method of ordinary conversation, and each is married to all." End quote. In other words, the only way to live a sinless life of Christian perfection was to embrace the desire to sleep with multiple people. The Putney group was initially tentative about the whole idea of complex marriage, but in the winter of 1846, Mary Cragen's husband, George, confessed that he was interested in sleeping with Noyes' wife, Harriet. Harriet admitted to Noyes that the attraction was mutual. At the same time, Noyes and Mary were also interested in each other. Noyes organized a meeting between the four people, where they all confessed their attractions to each other's spouses. Mary Cragen journaled, quote, After these avowals, we considered ourselves engaged to each other, expecting to live in all conformity to the laws of this world until the time arrives for the consummation of our union, end quote. In other words, they became spiritually engaged to one another, with the promise of consummating these relationships once they were all in heaven, but they weren't prepared to actually break their marriage vows and sleep together before then. But Noyes decided to evolve the definition of spiritual marriage in May of 1846. Noyes and Mary were on a walk in the woods when he concluded that God wanted them to create heaven on earth right away. And since they were all spiritually engaged and planning to sleep together in heaven, this meant that they should already be sleeping together here on earth. Noyes called another meeting of the quartet. They all agreed to break their marriage vows. Noyes slept with Mary, and Harriet slept with George. By the end of 1846, Noyes' sisters and their husbands were also taking part in this communal marriage. However, some of the specific details about this communal marriage are lost to history. Most likely, Noyes wasn't sleeping with his sisters. A large amount of information on the cult is missing because Oneida Limited, the silverware company, later burned an enormous number of the community's historical documents to protect their reputation. And even in 1846, the group was worried about its secrets getting out. They didn't want to be ostracized from the Putney community for their unusual sexual practices. So they practiced complex marriage privately during the early 1840s. The mere fact that they didn't experience any overt retribution by God seemed to them like proof that they were on the right path. Noyes' followers signed a statement of principles to reinforce the principle that everyone was married to each other. But as we've seen with other cult leaders, Noyes still found a way to establish himself as spiritually superior to everyone else in the group. Noyes included a safeguard in the contract that read, quote, John H. Noyes is the father and overseer whom the Holy Ghost has set over the family, thus constituted, end quote. No matter how egalitarian complex marriage seemed, Noyes still retained ultimate authority and control over the group. Noyes began to publicly claim that living a sin-free, perfectionist life had curative effects. He cited his alleviation from disease of the throat and lungs, which had plagued him since childhood, as well as Mary Cragen's recovery from recurring headaches without the aid of doctors. Vanessa is going to take over on the psychology here and throughout the episode. Please note, Vanessa is not a licensed psychologist or psychiatrist, but she's done a lot of research for the show. Thanks, Greg. Cult expert Robert Lifton would later coin the term mystical manipulation to explain how cult leaders transform coincidences like these into evidence of divine intervention. But Noyes soon went beyond claiming his lifestyle had cured him of his own illnesses. He began insisting that he could spiritually heal others. 
Unlike most cult leaders who know they're lying about their professed healing abilities, it appears that Noyes really believed he could heal the sick through his faith in God. In June of 1847, he decided to prove his spiritual healing abilities to the wider Putney community by offering to aid a Putney resident named Harriet Hall. Mrs. Hall had been bedridden for years with chronic pain and near blindness. Mrs. Hall's previous treatments included the Thompsonian treatment, in which vomiting and diarrhea were induced with herbs in order to purge toxins from the body. This treatment may actually have been worsening her symptoms by dehydrating her. When Noyes and Mary Cragen visited Mrs. Hall, they ended the Thompsonian treatments and tried to heal her through prayer. Mrs. Hall reported, quote, Mrs. Cragen raised the curtain and let in the blaze of the day. My eyes were perfectly well and drank in the beauty of the world all new to me with wonderful pleasure, end quote. It's hard to say exactly what helped Mrs. Hall feel so much better that day. Perhaps it was a combination of placebo effect and the cessation of the harmful Thompsonian treatments. But regardless, Mrs. Hall's recovery enhanced Noyes' belief in his own spiritual superiority. But not all of Noyes' healing endeavors went so smoothly. In the summer of 1847, Noyes' attempt to heal a young woman failed so spectacularly that it threatened to destroy the entire Oneida community. Let's take a quick break to talk about another great ParCast podcast, Unexplained Mysteries. Unexplained Mysteries has a new host. Our good friend Molly from Conspiracy Theories is teaming up with her co-host Richard from Gone. And together they're hosting Unexplained Mysteries. Molly and Richard don't take, we don't know, for an answer. Every Thursday, they investigate the greatest mysteries of history and life on Earth and search for the answers to the unknown. You can listen to episodes on Stonehenge and the Roswell cover-up right now. So when you're done with this podcast, search for Unexplained Mysteries on your favorite podcast directory to start listening now. Or visit Parcast, P-A-R-C-A-S-T dot com slash unexplained to listen now. Now let's get back to our story. By 1847, John Humphrey Noyes had established a community of around 45 people in Putney, Vermont. As he grew more confident, he began trying to win the favor of the local residents by showing off his skills as a faith healer. In June of 1847, he appeared to successfully heal a woman named Mrs. Hall. But Noyes' healing career was somewhat short-lived. Later in the summer of 1847, he was asked to attend to a young woman dying of consumption. Of course, Noyes couldn't actually heal her illness, and she died. Word spread and Putney residents began to regard Noyes with suspicion. Noyes attempted to defend himself by character assassinating the dead woman. He claimed that it was the young woman's lack of faith that prevented her from getting better. Noyes couldn't bring himself to admit that he was wrong about his ability to heal the woman. He thought he was leading a sinless life and that he was incapable of making mistakes. According to cult expert Robert Lifton's concept of doctrine over person, cult leaders often come up with excuses to hand wave or explain away events that disprove their theology. Noyes couldn't stand the fact that the citizens of Putney were doubting his healing abilities. He decided to confide in the halls as a way of gaining their support. Since he had seemingly healed Mrs. Hall, Noyes figured that he could trust them. A few months after Noyes healed Mrs. Hall, Mary Cragen gave birth to Noyes' son, Victor, on September 6, 1847. Mary had been pregnant with Victor when she and Noyes allegedly healed Mrs. Hall, and Noyes confided in Mr. Hall that he believed the electricity generated by his and Mary's bond was what healed Mrs. Hall. Mr. Hall was seemingly receptive to Noyes' admission, But a week later, he exposed complex marriage to the Putney community. The consequences were immediate. On October 25, 1847, the local court served a writ for the arrest of Noyes for adultery and adulterous fornication. One local priest wrote, quote, How lamentable it is that such fine talents, refined education, respectability of family, and moral influence should all be prostrated to such vile purposes. 
end quote. Soon Noyes' community was under threat from angry mobs. Noyes fled to Brattleboro on November 26th of 1847 to consult with his brother-in-law, the lawyer Larkin Mead. Through Mead, Noyes made an offer to officials in Putney. Noyes and the others involved in complex marriage would leave Putney if the town left the rest of the Noyes' community alone. The officials agreed, but the townspeople were still furious with Noyes' group. It wasn't safe for anyone associated with Noyes to stay in Putney. Noyes had become quite a spin doctor by this time, and once again made use of mystical manipulation. He claimed that God was showing them that they should spread their kingdom of God like dandelion seeds in the wind, so others could join. His tactic successfully persuaded the community members to follow him. By fall of 1848, everyone had left Putney to set up a new community 200 miles away on a plot of land in Oneida Creek, New York. The land was owned by perfectionist Jonathan Burt. Burt bought it from the state of New York after the state stole it from the Oneida Nation in a series of so-called treaties, the last of which was signed in 1842. It bears mentioning that the Oneida Indian Nation have filed many lawsuits against the state of New York to recover their land since the 1970s and won several cases. In spite of Noyce's claims that he cared about all people, there's no evidence that he had any qualms about settling on stolen land. He also showed no particular concern for the Oneida people who had been forced off their own land. Ironically, Noyes even commented, quote, There's some romance in beginning our community in the log huts of the Indians, end quote. By 1848, Noyes' Oneida community had grown to 84 people. He wanted them to live under a single roof as one family, so his followers built a mansion designed by Erastus Hamilton that was 60 feet long by 35 feet wide and had three stories. But Noyes found that having children underfoot all the time made life chaotic at the mansion house. And as a way of maintaining control over his group, he developed the concept of sticky love. Sticky love referred to any strong attachment, whether it was a lover, a parent, child, friend, or even leisure activity. Noyes claimed that stickiness was damaging to the communal spirit. He likely felt threatened by sticky love since followers who formed close familial bonds might become more attached to each other than to Noyes and the community. In fact, Noyes was so threatened by the natural bonds between his followers and their young children that he came up with the concept of philoprogenitiveness. According to Noyes, this concept meant parents' natural love and preference for their own kids undermined the communal nature of Oneida. In an attempt to weaken the bonds between the parents and the children, Noyes ordered his followers to move all of the kids into two houses, collectively called the Children's House. A small number of the community's men and women were chosen to raise and educate all the children. Mothers cared for their babies until they were 18 months old, and then the toddlers joined the other children at the children's house. Parents and children were generally allowed one visit per week. This system did have some benefits. Male and female caregivers shared child-rearing duties equally, an uncommon occurrence even in modern times. Relieved of the burdens of constantly caring for their children, women in the community were free to pursue other activities. Women helped with traditional men's work, like construction, and men helped with traditionally women's work, like laundry. But there are potential downsides to raising children in an institutionalized setting. According to neuropsychologist Ronald Federici, institutionalized children have a greater risk of developing cognitive and psychological impairments. They may struggle with processing and expressing emotions, as well as interpreting the emotions of others. And the Mayo Clinic advises that kids raised in a children's home or institutionalized setting are at a higher risk of developing reactive attachment disorder, a serious and lifelong condition which makes it difficult for a child to form healthy relationships. There are actually two types of reactive attachment disorder. Children with symptoms of inhibited attachment disorder are withdrawn and quiet. They ignore caregivers and don't look to adults for comfort. Children with uninhibited attachment disorder are overly friendly with strangers and display inappropriate behavior. 
The disorder seems to affect children on a neurological level. A 2015 study found that children diagnosed with reactive attachment disorder had less gray matter in their left visual cortex than children without the disorder. Not only were the children at Oneida discouraged from forming strong attachments to their parents, they were also actively discouraged from forming exclusive friendships. They weren't even allowed to bond with their toys. One account describes how kids considered too attached to their dolls were forced to throw them in the fire. The adults in the community also struggled to cope with the forced separation from their children. One mother outright pleaded with her son to tell her that he loved her when they were alone together. He later vividly recalled, quote, how tightly she held me and how long, as though she would never let me go, end quote. But Noyes wasn't just concerned about breaking the bonds between parents and children. He was also worried about the bonds between married couples. New married converts at Oneida were encouraged to rid themselves of the marriage spirit by having sex with other people in order to fully join the community's complex marriage. Husbands were encouraged to set up a meeting with their legal wives and another man she was interested in having sex with. These meetings frequently led to interviews, a euphemism the community used for sexual encounters. By weakening the bonds between husbands and wives, parents and children, Noyes was ensuring that his followers depended on him and the community instead of each other. And with the community reliant on him, Noyes was able to manipulate his followers into altering the community rules so that the community better served his disturbing psychological and sexual needs. In 1851, Noyes delivered a lecture with the, quote, practical suggestion of ascending and descending fellowship. The elders of the community were now going to provide sexual instruction to the pre-teen and teenage members of the community. Conveniently for Noyes, he was the principal elder in the community. The other elders were men and women in their 50s and 60s. Noyce claimed that by having sex with the children and teens, he and the other elders could bring them closer to God. He called this process initiation. Disturbingly, some of these children deemed ready for sex with older adults were as young as 10 years old. Even more disturbingly, Noyce made himself the point man for initiating the community's young girls. And while Noyce may have used euphemistic language at the time, Today, we can only describe Noyes' initiation process for what it is, the rape of a child. And as Noyes initiated many of the young girls, the boys were initiated by postmenopausal women. The thinking was that these women weren't at risk of pregnancy and could train the boys in male continence. Remember, that was the practice that involved men pulling out without ejaculating. We don't have much direct evidence that describes the specific impact the community's sexual practices had on its young people, but according to Rain, the Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network, adult survivors of child sexual assault can suffer negative psychological consequences, such as misplaced feelings of guilt and low self-esteem. They may also have trouble being intimate with other partners or setting boundaries. We can also get an idea of the potential impact of this practice by looking at the Centerpoint Commune. The Centerpoint Commune lasted from 1977 to 1991 in Albany, New Zealand, and its leader, Herbert Potter, encouraged the Commune's adults to sleep with the community's children. In a similar situation to Oneida, adults generally began sexually abusing children between the ages of 11 and 13. But Centerpoint men pressured and coerced girls, as young as 10, into sex. In 2011, professors from the University of Auckland and Massey University conducted a study of adults who had spent their childhoods in the commune. The study revealed that many abuse survivors struggled with psychological disorders, substance abuse, and difficulties in their interpersonal relationships. While some adult survivors recognized the abuse for what it was, Others were unwilling to even admit that they had been abused and insisted they had happy childhoods. But Noyes wasn't concerned about the potential impact on the community's children. On the contrary, he focused on expanding his community and spreading his commune's practices. His vision for a kingdom of God was bigger than just one commune.
In 1851, Noyes founded a second commune in Wallingford, Connecticut. Henry Allen, the owner of the property, actually deeded it to Jesus Christ. But since Jesus wasn't around to claim it, Allen conceded that Noyes was responsible for it for the time being. In the midst of the excitement about Wallingford, Mary Cragen, Noyes' first extramarital lover, took a boat trip in 1851. The boat capsized and she was trapped below deck. Mary drowned at the age of 41. This was a massive blow for Noyes, but he soldiered on, determined to expand his kingdom of God. He threw himself into establishing new communes. By 1853, Noyes had additional functioning communities in Brooklyn, Newark, Putney, and Cambridge. There were nearly 200 active members. The existence of additional properties meant that community members who grew too attached to each other could be sent to other compounds, like Wallingford, and isolated from each other. Noise was essentially creating an astounding level of what cult expert Robert Lifton describes as a milieu control, which refers to control over a follower's environment. But Noyce's efforts to isolate his lovelorn followers and prevent them from becoming emotionally attached to each other weren't always successful. For example, Noyce wrote to follower John Norton, quote, I do not wish you to forget her, nor to love her less, but cannot you love her without claiming her and quarreling with us and with God about her and almost shooting yourself on her account? This is not the right kind of love, end quote. As a way of keeping Oneida followers focused on the community instead of each other, Noyes introduced a practice called mutual criticism. The practice was rooted in the purification procedure Noyes learned from his missionary classmates when he was studying at Andover. At Oneida, most sessions of mutual criticism were at the request of their subject. Frequency ranged from once a month to several times a year. On occasion, a session was prescribed as a curative measure for a community member who others felt needed extra help. A criticism committee oversaw the proceedings. Any member of the community could contribute observations about the subject, with the supposed aim of helping the person improve themselves. Criticisms could be observations of sticky love or comments about one's temper, hygiene, propensity to talk too much or too little, laughing too loudly or chewing with one's mouth open. Anything was fair game. Author Wayland Smith writes, quote, Mutual criticism sought to ferret out the secret recesses of both body and soul that remained outside the healthy circulatory loop of the larger community, dissolving every particle of the self into the living unity of the whole." End quote. Cult expert Robert Lifton has noted that cults often use shaming tactics to break members down psychologically and force them to conform to the community's ideals. And it's clear that the purpose of Oneida's criticism committee was to ensure followers were completely attuned to the group. But while the criticism committee did try to shame members into better conforming to the community standards, they did also intentionally include praise as well. This meant Oneida members were not left as psychologically devastated by these criticism sessions as they could have been. It seems committee members genuinely thought they were helping members improve their moral character. But Noyes needed to do more than convince members to adhere to the group's values for Oneida to succeed. His community wouldn't survive unless he and his followers created sustainable businesses. In the early years of the community, Oneida's members tried to grow orchards. By the early 1850s, they dumped $47,000 into their orchard project. But bad weather hit and frostbite took out their entire crop. The community had no way to make money. If Noyes didn't act fast, his entire commune was going to collapse. In the early 1850s, John Humphrey Noyes and the rest of the Oneida community had nearly exhausted their savings trying to cultivate their orchard. After they lost their crop to inclement weather, Noyes scrambled to figure out a way they could support themselves. Luckily for Noyes, a trapper named Sewell Newhouse was among the Oneida ranks. He was known for making excellent hand-forged traps. Noyes gave the go-ahead to shift focus and try to capitalize on Newhouse's traps. 
Noise was controlling, but he was also smart and flexible enough to switch gears when necessary to help Oneida survive. The members of the community put their heads together and figured out ways to produce the traps in bulk. For example, instead of tempering the springs by hand at a rate of a few hundred a day, they developed a revolving oven that allowed them to temper 8 to 20,000 per batch. They went from producing 1,500 traps a year when they started to 100,000 by 1860. The financial success of the trap making allowed the community to thrive. By 1861, the Oneidans numbered 250. They needed more housing and built the New House, a mansion over twice the size of the original. But as Oneida prospered, America was torn apart by civil war. The Oneida community sat between two counties, and it fell through the cracks of the draft, because each county thought the community was part of the other's domain. Though a handful of Oneida men enlisted to fight for the Union, Noyes no longer cared about the abolition movement or freeing black men and women from slavery. Instead, the community paid a suggested bounty for most of their men to ensure they avoided serving in the war. The community also paid bounties for a number of townsmen in order to curry local favor. The locals generally disapproved of Oneida, but community money and provision of jobs went a long way towards softening relations. As the Civil War raged, the comparatively peaceful life of the Oneida community continued to attract new members. But among those new members were dangerous predators. In 1863, William Mills joined Oneida with his wife and three children. William was eager to participate in the community's practice of complex marriage. But community women found him repulsive. They consistently rebuffed his attempts to sleep with them. So William decided to target a more vulnerable population, the community's young girls. He used the classic grooming techniques of a sexual predator and initiated conversations about sex with girls by taking advantage of their desire to feel grown up. He also used his job in the kitchen to prey on children. He'd offer young girls special treats and get them drunk on wine he'd made in order to gain their trust. When the community learned that William was preying on the community's children, they convened meetings to figure out what to do. They'd never kicked anyone out before, but eventually they voted to get rid of him. In 1865, William was thrown out a window into the snow. He was the only person ever forced to leave. Noyes, rather hypocritically, later referred to Mills as a licentious scoundrel. But while Noyes may have found Mills abhorrent, he had no qualms about his own predatory behavior. Noyes didn't just appoint himself as the first sexual partner of the community's young girls. He groomed his own niece, Tirza Miller, into becoming his lover. Under the guise of religion and familial love, Noyes normalized incest. It was relatively normal in the mid-1800s for cousins to marry each other. But Tirza grew up believing it was perfectly acceptable to have sex not just with her cousins, but with her own uncles. According to Dr. Richard Cluft, quote, Incest is considered abusive when the individuals involved are discrepant in age, power, and experience, end quote. Noyes was the most powerful member of the Oneida community and 32 years older than his niece. He was clearly abusing his position to sleep with his sister's daughter. Dr. Cluft notes that victims of incest suffer from a wide range of psychological effects, and some feel obligated to play a role pleasing to others. This was certainly the case with Tirza. She was conditioned to believe that, if asked, she had to sleep with any man who requested her, even if she didn't want to. It wasn't until 1869, when she was 27, that she apparently realized she could refuse sexual encounters. In a diary entry in 1869, Tirza wrote about how she met with noise to have sex, but was not in the mood. She explained to him that she'd recently had sex with too many men she wasn't attracted to. When Noyes pointed out that she could refuse men that she wasn't interested in, the relief was obvious in her diary entry. Tirza wrote that she, quote, "...lost all appetite for intercourse with men whom I love and have always had splendid times with. I felt that it was at great expense to me and was taking all the romance out of life." 
but I didn't know what to do and thought I was doing my duty. Oh, I feel so relieved. I hardly dared to hope I need do nothing in this line, but what I felt an attraction for." End quote. In theory, women in the community were supposed to be able to refuse men's request to sleep with them. But in reality, it was very difficult for women to say no to powerful men in the community. Tirza's own words made it clear that she was pressured into sexual encounters she didn't want. But Noyes didn't just want to sleep with Tirza and the other women in the Oneida community. He wanted to breed them like cattle. In 1869, he decided to launch a primitive, decade-long eugenics experiment he called Sturpiculture and convinced 53 women to let him choose their reproductive partners. Noyes believed that if the members he deemed most spiritual had children together, those children would be spiritually superior. He thought the spirituality would be fixed in their blood, and that those children would become immortal. Of course, Noyes thought he was the most spiritual person in Oneida, and his own bloodline should be amplified as much as possible. So, it should come as no surprise that he selected his nieces, Tirza Miller and Charlotte Miller, as well as his own daughter, for his eugenics program. It seems unlikely Noyes ever slept with his own daughter, but Noyes was certainly interested in producing children with his nieces. Noyes personally fathered 10 of the 62 kids born of stirpiculture, and a full 50% of the children produced through his eugenics program were related to him. Tirza Miller was manipulated into believing it was normal to have children with her uncles. We know as a fact that she had a child with her uncle George, Noyes' brother. But Noyes didn't just encourage his niece to continue their incestuous relationship. He also used her as a bargaining chip. In 1873, Noyes wanted to keep a skilled mechanist named Edward Inslee from leaving Oneida. So he offered 32-year-old Tirza to Inslee as a child-bearing partner for the eugenics program. Despite being used as an enticement, Tirza went along with her uncle's machinations. She not only became pregnant with Inslee's child, she fell in love with him. But Noyes was still possessive of Tirza and unwilling to give up their incestuous sexual encounters. So he manipulated the community's rules again in an attempt to isolate Tirza and Inslee from each other. Noyes decreed that men should no longer care for the pregnant woman they were having a child with. This meant Inslee and Tirza needed to separate. While still pregnant with Inslee's child in January of 1874, Tirza made it clear in her diary that Noyes didn't want to give up his control over her. She writes that Noyes said, quote, How do you know but I shall have a baby by you myself, said he. I told him I should like that. He said he believed it to be his duty and that he had considerable curiosity to see what kind of child we should produce. He said to combine with me would be intensifying the noise's blood more than anything else he could do." End quote. As far as we know, Noyes never had a child with Tirza, but he did continue his incestuous relationship with her. Despite their horrific sexual initiation practices, the community managed to thrive for decades. They prospered economically, employing 200 outside workers and enjoyed a variety of leisure activities. But by 1877, Noyes was getting older. He was now 66 and losing his hearing and his voice, which made him a less effective leader. It's rare for a cult to survive once its leader dies or is arrested, but Noyes wanted to make sure his community lasted even after he was gone. On May 17, 1877, he asserted his right to place his now 36-year-old son Theodore at the helm. Begrudgingly, the community accepted. Theodore appointed one of his lovers, the respected spiritualist medium Anne Bailey Hobart, to serve as General Woman Superintendent at Oneida. A critical part of her duties was to be the community's sexual confidant and bookkeeper of sexual relations. That accounting had grown lax, and their aim was to keep track of who everyone was sleeping with. But Theodore and Anne lacked Noy's ability to manipulate and persuade people to their ways of thinking. The community balked at their rigidity, and the social structure began to crumble. Less than seven months after Theodore assumed the leadership position, he stepped down. 
By January of 1878, Noyes was back in charge, but he was ailing, defensive, and paranoid that the U.S. government was closing in. And he had good reason to be worried. Just five years earlier, the United States had passed its first obscenity law, known as the Comstock Law. Banned items included porn, art containing nudity, materials about abortion, contraception, or the prevention of sexually transmitted infections, and even student medical books. Oneida had quickly stopped publishing Noyce's most popular essay, Male Continence, in order to avoid trouble with this new law. But Protestant minister John Mears was fired up by Comstock's successes. Mears was based at Hamilton College, close to Oneida, and he was eager to shut the community down. But Mears wasn't the only one targeting the Oneida community. On June 21, 1879, the Syracuse Standard ran an article announcing communist noise to be arrested and legal proceedings to be taken. The article was nothing but falsehoods, but the community members had no idea that this was a bluff meant to frighten them. Terrified that Noyes was about to be arrested, his advisors urged him to flee the country. So Noyes got up early on June 23, 1879, snuck out of the mansion in his stockings and his boots in hand, and left for Canada. After Noyes' departure, the fragile community fractured. Three factions formed. One faction of Noyes' loyalists wanted the community to carry on like nothing had changed. A second faction wanted to introduce democratic ideals and more sexual freedom. And a third faction didn't think the community could survive without noise. They supported a return to monogamy. Young people generally joined this third faction. They worried that if the community disbanded, women would need the protection of legal husbands. And given that the year was 1879, they were likely right. On August 26, 1879, Noyes sent a letter from Canada offering a compromise. Marriage would be permitted and reviewed for approval by a council, but if the community wasn't going to practice complex marriage, then celibacy would be considered the most holy way to live. The community unanimously agreed to institute celibacy and legal marriage by September 4th. In the days before complex marriage officially ended, some members frantically made their way through as many lovers as possible, while others spent the time with the favorite lover, who they wouldn't be able to marry. But on September 4, 1879, complex marriage ended. And even though Noyes insisted that celibacy was the holiest way to live, Oneida's young people got married in droves. Tirza married a lover of hers named James Herrick on November 6th. She had a hard time choosing between him and Edward Inslee, but Noyes still held influence over her decision-making process. Ultimately, she went with the man Noyes liked better. Inslee kept trying to see Tirza anyway, but she refused him and eventually told him he should marry someone else. After a July 18, 1880 resolution the following year, arrangements were then made to divide Oneida's wealth and property amongst the community members. This was truly the end of Noyes' commune. Many of Noyes' former followers continued to live at Oneida, but they no longer shared everything between them freely. They became picky about their friends returning tools they once happily shared. Even though he was no longer under threat of arrest, Noyes remained in Canada. He claimed Niagara Falls would be the new location for a kingdom of God. But he wasn't well enough to found a new community. And on April 13, 1886, he died at home in bed. At his bedside were Tirza Miller, James Herrick, and Theodore Noyes, whose name was the final word on his father's lips. After John Noyes' death, the Oneida community successfully transformed itself into Oneida Limited. In the 20th century, they became famous selling silver-plated flatware and, ironically, a very conventional idea of the American family. In 1947, as the community approached its 100-year anniversary, the former Oneida community members and their descendants at the company became increasingly concerned that Oneida Limited's wholesome image would be undermined if the public learned about the sexual practices of the 19th century commune. 
So in 1947, corporate officers filled a truck with documents from the Oneida archive, transported them to the local dump, and burned them to ash. Much of what is known about John Humphrey Noyes and Oneida has been gleaned from his personal writings, surviving community records, and the letters and diaries of other members of the Oneida community. We'll never know what dark secrets were scrubbed from history in the 1947 fire, leaving us to forever wonder what Oneida's descendants didn't want us to know about John Humphrey Noyes and his community. Thanks again for tuning in to Cults. If you want to listen to any previous episodes of Cults, you can find them on Apple Podcasts, TuneIn, Google Play, Stitcher, and Spotify, or on our website, parcast.com, spelled P-A-R-C-A-S-T dot com. If you like what you hear, please leave a five-star review or tell us what you think on social media. We're on Facebook and Instagram as at Parcast and Twitter at Parcast Network. It seems simple, but it really helps our show. Cults was created by Max Cutler and is a production of Cutler Media and is part of the Parcast Network. It is produced by Max and Ron Cutler, sound designed by Ron Shapiro, with production assistance by Joel Stein and Paul Mahler. Additional production assistance by Maggie Admire, Carly Madden, and Jeanette Manning. Cults is written by M.W. Cartosian Wilson and stars Greg Polson and Vanessa Richardson. Don't forget to subscribe to the Parcast newsletter. It'll keep you up to date on all the latest Parcast news. Whether it's information on the Serial Killers live tour or the launch of our Great Women of Business podcast, the Parcast newsletter will make sure you don't miss any of the action. Go to Parcast.com now and enter your email address. You'll be glad you did.